Welcome to the Goodyear City Council meeting. We're excited to have you be a part of this important public process. Tonight, you will have the opportunity to address City Council on both non-agenda and agenda items. The agendas and the speaker request cards are located on the tables outside of council chambers. You must fill out a speaker card in order to address the city council. Please hand in your completed card to the city clerk before the start of the meeting. If the meeting has already begun, please hand it to any city staff. You may also check the I do not wish to speak option on the card. This allows you to still voice your opinion on an item on the record without having to speak. Public comment on a non-agenda item will take place during the citizen comment portion of the evening. These are items that don't appear on tonight's formal agenda. The city clerk will call your name when it's time for you to speak. At that time, please approach the podium and state your name for the record. We ask that you speak clearly into the microphone. You'll have a maximum of three minutes and there is a timer visible from the podium. When the light changes from green to yellow, your time is coming to an end. When the light turns red, your time is up. Note that you may also choose not to speak if other speakers before you have said what you wanted to say. Shouting, cheering, and loud noises will not be tolerated, and violators may be removed for disrupting the meeting. Goodyear City Council meetings stream live on Facebook and YouTube and online at GoodyearAZ.gov. Thank you for your participation in tonight's meeting. I'd like to call the regular meeting to order March 1st, 2021. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and the invocation. to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Almighty God, we thank you for the privilege of serving representatives of, of our community. Please guide us as we come together to discuss important matters that impact our city. Give us clarity and wisdom as we decide the best actions to accomplish our goals. We pray for open hearts and minds to help maintain unity. May each member of this team feel valued and may we recognize the skill sets and the knowledge that each person brings to the table. We ask for your protection over the uniformed personnel both here and abroad, as well as the first responders and all those who devote themselves to public service. We seek to honor you in everything we say and do, so lift this meeting up to you. Be in our midst. Bind our hearts and minds. Amen. Amen. Okay, we it's, uh, like to call the, I think I called the regular meeting to order. Thank you. And we did the pledge. So uh, will the city clerk please read the information for participants who would like to listen to tonight's meeting? While the Goodyear City Council meetings are open to the public, the occupancy has been reduced to implement social distancing. Seating is generally available on a first-come basis, but meeting attendees will be cycled in and out if necessary to allow for speakers to speak on certain agenda items. If you wish to speak during a regular meeting, please complete a speaker's card so that we may ensure you are in the room for that item. Face masks are required and must be worn when moving throughout the building. Our residents still have several ways to address the council. They may submit their questions and comments to public comments at GoodyearAZ.gov, and during meetings, residents can view the meeting using Facebook, YouTube, or the live session link on the meeting video page on the city clerk's office website. After the meetings are completed, they can also be viewed on YouTube. The public may always contact the mayor and council at any time by sending an email to gycouncil at GoodyearAZ.gov. Thank you very much. Well, tonight we only have one communication item. We will receive an update on the Water Conservation Committee from our Water Resources and Sustainable Manager. And we're asking tonight everybody that comes to the dice to introduce themselves and their position.
Good evening, Mayor Lord and Council. Gretchen Irwin, the Water Resources and Sustainability Manager. Um, thank you so much um, for the opportunity this evening to update you on the city's water conservation program, including the recommendations from the Water Conservation Committee. The committee was commissioned by Council in 2016 for two years and concluded with 12 recommendations focused on outdoor water use. Um, next slide. The pie chart shows that the majority or a good deal of water, 60% of water in Goodyear is used outdoors. This is water that doesn't go to the water reclamation facility and gets treatment for reuse. So this is water that's lost to us. Um, many of the conservation activities um, overlap and many, may meet more than one recommendation. So instead of going through all the recommendations one by one, I'm gonna present the different programs and activities that fall under a collective theme. So I apologize for the busyness of this slide, but I wanted to give you a sample of all the things that we've been doing under outreach, education, engagement, and customer friendly services. So our water conservation classes went virtual last fall. They were a big success. We actually increased our attendance by up to 500%, and I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> we had sometimes like 30 people on um, our Zoom call. We had a live instructor, and at the end of the class, we had a Q&A. The um, recorded classes were then uploaded to YouTube for those who couldn't attend. Um, we have our spring classes up on the website now, so you're more, um, so everyone is, uh, encouraged to sign up for the classes. Um, we've been doing a lot of messaging um, geared toward the value of water, water efficiency, and tips for water savings. Um, we do a weekly Water Wednesday Blast that goes out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, we've also created our very own Goodyear graphic and the little orange is just a sample of it um, with water slogans such as every drop counts and it's a beautiful day to save water. Um, this messaging is up on the I-10 billboard, the internal TV billboards, and on the sides of the solid waste and bulk trash trucks. Um, messages are gonna be changed out on a regular basis, and I think some of them got changed out today, so we've got new messaging out. Um, we've been trying new and creative ways to engage um, both the residents and the employees. Um, this year, it was a little tough with COVID and not being able to get out to events that we normally have. Um, last spring, when we were all getting used to our stay at home and walk around the neighborhood status, uh, we launched an Embrace the Desert Bingo card that you could view on your phone as you walked around and identify some of the, the beautiful low water use plants that you see. Uh, we also have done um, several contests with um, the employees, such as water trivia. Um, we're hoping not only to educate the residents, but the employees as, as well, so that they may be by proxy water advocates also. Um, we've also introduced a water budgeting tool. Um, water resources will help you build a customized water budget for your household. Um, we ask you a series of questions such as how many people live in your house? How often do you take showers? How often do you do your laundry, wash clothes? Um, are your plants high or low water use? Um, and we can look on uh, Google Earth or other images and tell how much turf you have and how much uh, non-turf uh, landscaping. And then we'll give you a, a water budget, budget for a water efficient household of your size. And we can compare that to your last year's water bills also. Um, so far we've had over 60 residents take advantage of this. Um, we also offer it to HOAs and um, businesses, but none of them have taken advantage of it so far. Uh, Project WET is the education program affiliated with the University of Arizona. Um, they host the water festivals. Um, this year, in lieu of an in-person event, Goodyear's partnered with Project WET to do a virtual event for Goodyear schools. Um, there will be Goodyear videos on topics such as the importance of water, conservation, and water careers. So these are scheduled for this month. Um, this slide um, are, addresses some of the more technology-based programs 
that we're using to address outdoor landscaping. Um, we've implemented a Flume pilot program. Flume is a monitoring device that's attached to your water meter and an app is then installed on your phone or your laptop and then you can monitor your real-time water use. Um, the information that can be obtained is very similar to the information that's provided by AMI. Um, we are interested in this pilot. We wanna see uh, to what level of resident engagement that we get and then actual water savings. This will be helpful to us when deciding if we want to make that significant investment in the AMI collectors and portal software. This is our very first pilot, so we went small. Um, we're using employee residents and we have 11 units out. Um, we do hope to expand, but we wanted to be able to shake the bugs out first. Um, on the very first week, one of the residents already discovered a leak um, and people could see exactly when they were turning on their washer and um, flushing toilets and as they were excited. So um, just to update you on the AMI, um, there's currently a meter replacement program um, ongoing, which replaces all the meters that are over 15 years old with AMI capable meters. Um, and as well as all the new meters that are going in the new builds are all AMI capable. Another program we have is the large landscape water efficiency program with flu or I'm sorry, water fluence. Um, we're promoting that with just the HOAs. Um, each site gets a customized water budget based on estimates of irrigated area, type of plants, type of irrigation system and local daily weather. And then at the end of the billing cycle, Waterfluence provides the um, customer with all the data and then tips for improvement. Um, we have a couple of HOAs already participating, but now we've able, uh, been able to expand the program. So um, we're hosting a virtual Goodyear HOA Education Academy on April 28th uh, for community managers and board members. So the presentation will be done um, by the executive director of water fluence. Um, irrigation smart controllers. So we have ordered our smart controllers. Um, we actually have some already in the office. Um, a smart controller allows you to automatically manage your sprinklers from anywhere using their app on your phone. And you can customize it based on your plant materials as well as um, connect it to a local weather station. And then the smart part comes in is when your irrigation system will automatically adjust based on the weather station readings, based on rain, wind, or temperatures. Um, we're gonna be piloting three different brands um, before we expand the program. And so then there's the very low tech landscape incentive that we're doing. Um, we have a modest landscape incentive um, ongoing. It's to incentivize the replacement of high water use plants with low water use plants. Um, to be eligible, we ask that you take one of our free water conservation classes and then complete a, a quick survey afterward. You can receive a $50 purchase card to one of two local nurseries where you can only get low water use plants. Um, you must be a good year service area customer and you're only eligible for one card per household per year. The landscape design standards were um, the number one recommendation of the Water Conservation Committee. Um, Development Services has taken the lead on this project. Um, currently their contractor is preparing a draft for review. Um, water resources did provide a list of recommendations, including things like limiting turf to usable recreation areas, um, limiting turf in model homes to 20% of the landscapable area, and requiring the use of the city's preferred plant list of low water use plants for HOAs and um, open spaces and buffer areas. So this is already a require, requirement um, for city right of ways as per our designation. Conservation rate structure. Um, this plan was recently adopted by you um, and we continue to utilize the inverted block rate structure where the price per unit increases with increased use. 
water intensive exceptions. Um, since 2019, we've been reviewing new water uses, keeping in mind what was allocated to that parcel in the integrated water master plan. Um, that was based on the land use plan. If the potential customer is asking for more water, an evaluation can be made as to whether the city wants to allot the additional water resources. If we choose not to, then we can ask the business to provide that additional water. Um, these solutions have generally been provided through the developers agreements. And the water main flushing program. Um, this is currently underway as we prepare for our new surface water treatment plant. Um, approximately one third of the system has been done and they're utilizing a combination of both regular flushing and then the no des um, system, which recirculates the flush water back through the system. So, so I'll conclude with some of our messaging. So every day is a beautiful day to save water in Goodyear. And I think that our residents are truly believers. Um, AMWA just released a little study where it showed that um, the Goodyear's residential per capita use was the lowest of the 10 AMWA cities. Um, the average for the Phoenix metro area is 140, 47 gallons per capita per day, and Goodyear's is in the low 80s. So um, the highest was one of those East Valley cities that uses over 200 gallons You're per capita per day. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of golf courses. Um, so our goal is to develop a robust and sustainable conservation program to maintain and improve our current efficiencies. And we're also trying to develop a culture of water awareness and to be water wise in Goodyear. So, thank you. Thank you. Council, any questions? Yes, Sherry. First of all, thank you so much for all your hard work. That's great. All the programs you're getting to save water. Um, from the last AMWA meeting, they had a that um, water audit that you filled out. Did you see that? Um, the the water loss audit? Yeah, well, for your home that you can fill out how much oh, water yes. you use and you fill it like little house comes up and you fill out the house. Are we going to be able to hook into that on our city site? Because that was actually look kind of fun. Thanks. That's a great question. And I should have mentioned that. Um, I did put the link to that. And we've been using something almost exactly the same. Oh, okay. Um, but now if you are like a Liberty Water um, provider resident or use customer, you can, if you look on our website, the link to that AMWA uh, water budgeting tool is available. Yeah, because it's a, it's a lot of fun to fill out. I want to mm -hmm. fill that out. And the fume, fume that, that looks actually wonderful. So I, I'll be happy to volunteer if you need it. See how bad I do. I'll try to do better. Uh, okay. And I do have one <laughs> question. Um, for our legislature, have you heard anything? Because there seems to be all these tax breaks if you convert your fireplace, if you put low use windows. Is there any tax breaks or do we know of any that are going in for people that do convert their turf to, you know, that grass or rock or something? Do we know if they're thinking of anything like that to help out? No, I haven't seen anything um, at all proposed this legislation. Okay. This well, legislation. Thank you so much for your hard work. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Well, Gretchen, I also want to thank you for your great presentation. Uh, it, we're getting so many new residents coming from all over the country, and I think it's so important to keep the conversation and the education going about water conservation. And I'm really pleased to hear about the AMWA uh, ranking, how well we're doing, and I think that's really something to celebrate. So uh, not that it gets us out of the woods. I mean, we have to continue to conserve, but I think we're off to a great start. I also want to thank you for all the creativity, the different pilots that you're offering, and I'm really pleased to hear. I guess that's the upside of the pandemic is moving the um, water education online has really broadened the audience, and so uh, that's that's really good news. So thank you, um, and I really want to just mention your work with the HOAs. I know that's been a little bit tougher, um, but I think the, uh, there's a good return on that investment because of the heavy water use. So well done. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd just like to thank you for it, and it really was uh, pretty spectacular how developed, how far we are into that program. And this council always likes to win something, so uh, mm -hmm. we like our ranking. So thanks so much. Tell the team thank you. You're welcome. And I do want to thank, we have a great team at Public Works, so um, it's 
it's a great team effort. Well, just to extend our thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Now it's the time for citizens who would like to address our city council on any non-agenda item within the jurisdiction of the Goodyear City Council. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right. Uh, does anyone in the audience want to speak? All right, then we'll get on with the consent agenda. Will the city clerk please read consent agenda items two through four by title only? Number two, approval of minutes. Number three, acceptance of a fire hydrant and water line easement associated with the Goodyear Airport Industrial Project. Number four, approval of issuance of temporary construction and access easement associated with the Goodyear Civic Square City Hall development. Does anyone on the council wish to remove an item from this consent agenda? Does anyone? Um, I guess for then we'll just go ahead to a motion here. So can I have a motion and a second to approve items two through four? Do I have that motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion from Councilman Hampton and a second from Councilman Bazillo. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stipp? Aye. Council Member Pazillo? Aye. Council Member Loritano? Aye. Council Member Campbell? Aye. Council Member Hampton? Aye. Council Member Kano? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. All right, there's one public hearing on the agenda. This item is to consider a planned development amendment to amend the restated and amended final planned area development for the Ballpark Village and Ballpark Village South. This is a continuation, just to inform you, Council, from a public hearing that was open on February 22nd, so I'm not going to use the gavel. So we'll receive information from Development Services, and again, would you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Mayor. Karen Craver, Principal Planner with the Development Services Department. The Ballpark Village PAD is one PAD for what we know as Ballpark Village and Ballpark Village South. They are both on the east side of Estrella Parkway and oops. Okay. Well, They're both on the east side of Estrella Parkway. Ballpark Village surrounds the ballpark. Ballpark Village South is this area that is just west of the development complexes, and it is up against Estrella Parkway and Wood Boulevard. And I, I apologize that I switched the alignments on you here, but I wanted you to be able to see the text in this map. Ballpark Village South is uh, approved for single and multifamily development. It has three categories, one being Res 1, which has five to 10 dwelling units per acre. Mm -hmm. In the middle, it is Res 2 and has six to 15 dwelling units per acre. And then in Res 3, it is 5 to 30 dwelling units per acre. And both R1, Res 1, and Res 2 had a maximum building height of 42 feet, and Res 3 had a maximum building height of 75 feet. I am, sorry. Anyway, we received this PAD amendment request from El Dorado Holdings, the owner of Res 1 and Res 2. So the southernmost and the middle parcel on that map. And the revision was to change the density ranges in all three categories to five to 30 dwelling units per acre. So it went from the lowest density of five up to the highest of 30, so they would all have the same. It also took the three building heights for each one and put them all at 55. And staff supported the change because of the consistency. It's, it's easier for a customer if they come in and are looking at property in the area to have one set of standards they have to look at. And quite frankly, it makes it easier for staff to administer it as well. 
And just to show you what happened, this on the left was the existing, the, the heights 42 up to 75, the densities from five all the way up to 30. The proposal was to make everything 55 and make the densities all five to 30. And the amendment was submitted by El Dorado Holdings because a company, a developer called Alliance Residential wants to develop that Res 1 parcel, the southernmost that I had shown you on the map. And the density there being only five to 10, they wanted a higher density for their multi-story, multi-family complex. And the height revision really was something that staff was trying to do as a, as a housekeeping measure. Uh, the elevations that you see here on this slide is where we have gotten to so far since the pre-app meeting that we had with Alliance Residential. And I had put a comparison slide as an attachment to your staff report. So we've gotten quite a ways with them since since their initial submittal in terms of meeting the PAD design guidelines and the city design guidelines. But they've now submitted a site plan application. So we're gonna continue to work with them more through that process to, to enhance these elevations even more. And doing our normal public outreach, which is notifying all the property owners within 500 feet of a rezone application we also notified the other property owners within the PAD itself. And there are four other property owners. Two of them are in the ballpark village area and they supported the amendment. The other two are located in the res three area and they did not support it. And res three being the northernmost in that map that I showed you. And then we also got one email from, or two emails from one resident who just did not support multifamily in general. And this is just to show you what those other property owners have done out there so far. This is the clubhouse that one of the property owners built. It's a facility for the Indians to reside in when they're here for spring training. And it's been out there a couple of years and is located just across Wood Boulevard from the Indians Development Complex. This is Salas at Ballpark Village. It has now gone through site plan approval and has been permitted for development. And this particular building will front right on Estrella Parkway. Um, and even though those two property owners didn't support the amendment, we were still legally able to proceed with the amendment and for the amendment to be approved. So we went ahead and took the amendment as proposed to the planning commission. And the planning commission did in fact vote to recommend approval by a vote of four to two, but the two members who dissented one cited a change in vision for Ballpark Village South as a concern, and another cited the possibility of high-rise apartment buildings as a concern. But as I said, nonetheless, they did recommend approval as a group. Um, but then staff and, and the applicant, El Dorado Holdings, talked the next day and felt that, you know, because it wasn't a unanimous vote from commission and because there was this non-support from the other two property owners, we wanted to see if maybe we could work it out so those objections were no longer there, at least from the property owners. So what we worked out was that the density amendment would only occur in res one and two, the southern and the middle, both of them owned by El Dorado Holdings, none of the property owned by the other two developers who have already gotten approvals and built. And then the maximum building height would simply be from 42 feet in res one and two up to 46, which would accommodate the proposed multi-story that Alliance Residential wants to do. 
And, and with that compromise between staff and the applicant, staff is supporting the revised amendment. It meets the zoning ordinance criteria for a rezone, and we are recommending approval subject to the stipulations in the ordinance attached to your staff report. I understand your applicants here, that they wanna speak. Welcome. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Brennan Ray, 1850 North Central, uh, here on behalf of the applicant. I am happy to speak as long or as short as this group would like. I was advised by Mr. Bull that I should say nothing more than we agree 100% with staff and that I should sit down and shut up. <laughs> Very good. Sounds like him. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right. But, but anybody in the audience besides the one that just spoke would like to speak. All right. Then I'm going to close the public hearing. And will the city clerk please read resolution number 2021-2030 by title only. Adopt resolution number 2021-2030 declaring as public records those certain documents filed with the city clerk titled official supplementary zoning map number 20-03A legal description and restated an amended final planned area development for Ballpark Village and Ballpark Village South dated November 23rd, 2020. Thank you. Can I have a motion a second to approve resolution number 2021-2030? Do I hear that motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion from Councilman Campbell and a second from Vice Mayor Stipp. Open for council discussion, Wally Campbell. I have a, a question, Karen, for uh, setting the uh, height of 42 to 46 feet. Is that the same requirement that was put on the uh, building for the Cleveland Indians? Is that the same height? Do you know? Mayor, if I may. Yes, you may. Councilwoman Campbell, that is in that res three area. And for them, the maximum height had been 75 feet. That's what was allowed in that area. That being a three story building, it's probably within 40 to 45 feet, maybe. I'm just trying for us to be consistent so that all of the buildings are pretty much the same height. Right. If we're gonna have them high at all, then they all, instead of having 142 and 170 or 120 and whatever, because that the Cleveland um, residential building is lovely and it does serve a wonderful purpose because we have a lot of young men who are coming to our city to try out for Major League Baseball and they need places to live and or rent either one and um, I think the vision for the ballpark has changed so many times since I have been on council uh, but I'm thrilled that we have someone that wants to move in that area just to get it started mm -hmm. and the vision will continue to change because I remember when we the ballpark was sold to us as a resident we were going to have stores on the bottom lofts on the top and we we're going to have entertainers ten, entertainment we we're going to have restaurants and uh, we're still waiting but we do uh, I, I do think it's going to be a wonderful uh, addition to that area and it's a perfect fit Joe Pizzolo. Yeah, it's the only thing I ask, and I'm sure staff will, is as you work on the facade of the facility, you know how we, at least how I, how I kind of view the facades, inside has to meet certain standards, that I just don't rent them. Outside is what we see, so a kind of mixture of colors, you know, maybe some material on there to dress it up, so it just has a little more than just plain fit. And it's my understanding, too, those rents are going to go from about between 1200 and 1600 Is that accurate to the... Does that sound about right? Yes, that does. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor? You know, Wally, it's interesting that, that you mentioned the change and, you know, we go back to the um, city center and how it changed and changed and now it's gone. Um, and I, I think we're, we're seeing that and that's one of the challenges with visioning is is it's really about setting expectations, but um, this uh, this particular project I think is is uh, it's a good location. It's a good spot for multifamily. Um, it will certainly, uh, from an architectural perspective, it looks like it fits with the um, the ball club 
dorms and the ball field itself. So I think if we're keeping that theme rolling, um, you know, and there is a there is a lot of pressure on the community from the community about multifamily, and um, I think we we need to be smart about it. And this is one of those locations that it's very smart um, to put in uh, a multi-story, multifamily um, location. So I, I'm, I'm excited about it. I know we've probably been through two or three iterations of um, what we'll see residential there. Hopefully this one gets built, <laughs> um, but, uh, um, but, but I think this is, this is the right place and the right time for that particular project. Sherry Lorotano. I, I agree with the, the vice mayor. I, I think if we stick too much to just one vision, although, you know, things change. And I think this is a good spot for multifamily. I know a lot of people just hear multifamily and automatically say, oh, no, bad. But it, it's not. Um, these projects come before us, and, and we look at the area they're at, and this is a great spot for that, right by the ballpark, right, to have that density. Mm -hmm. um, and since I've been on council and even when I was on planning and zoning, that area's just been dirt. Um, it'll be great to start seeing it fill in, which will bring other things. And uh, I think a lot of people don't realize when we do the houses and the housing tracks, um, we may, you know, approve several of those. And those are hundreds of, I mean, houses. So um, these projects um, are looked at, and you guys do a great job at that. So I do support it. I think it looks great. I, I appreciate you working to kind of make sure it keeps that theme going as well. I, I do like that. So I think it'll be a great fit there. So thank you. Brandon. Yes, also, thank, thank you for the presentation as well. I do appreciate the enhancements to the building to make it fit in and match the rest of the area there. Um, I think it's one of the biggest complaints we get sometimes is poor-looking multifamily, if they are multifamily. So um, I had a question on the change here. So I know we said we're going – so this zoning change changes the – was it res 1 and 2 to be the same – and do we know what's already planned over in Res Two? The res, middle, the middle one there. Yeah, I think it's isn't it single family or yes. single story? Those uh, Todd Christopher Todd style things. Single story rental apartments. And and I I got to tell you I'm going to brag on myself a little here. I, I think you will, because of where it is, because it be, is in the ballpark and the city has made such an investment in there. Um, we, we went around and round and round, and, and I think that you're going to find that these, they're single-story rentals there, but I think they're going to look real good. And there's a lot of different colors and materials and architectural styles. Same product, but they're going to look different, and the street frontage is going to look different. And I think you'll be pleased. And it's just another opportunity for another renter who wants a different product yeah. to be there in that good location. And then my second question is: Will there be cutouts onto onto Estrella? Is that the main exit for those three phases, or are they going to the inner inner tract of the road? Or I'm just curious how that. Yeah. It's going to be set up or what the traffic flow would be onto the main street. Yeah. Um, the Solace at Ballpark Village, that four-story building that I showed you that will be in Res 3, Three. they will come out directly onto Estrella Parkway. And the single-story rental and the Alliance Residential, the third store, the three-story multifamily that will be in Res 1, they will have one joint access onto Estrella Parkway. You know, okay. the, prop the properties are both owned by El Dorado Holdings, so that's how it's set up, the, the single-story rental product and the multi-story rental product come together with an entrance onto a straight park. All right. And we don't foresee uh, another light between where there are two lights are on that road there. There will be a new light at that center arrow where those at, two projects come out. At res two? Yes, in res two that will serve res two and res one. There will be one light there. Okay. I'm just curious. I know, I know there's one on, is that lower Buckeye? 
and then one on, is that wood? Or maybe I'm thinking farther south there. There's one on wood south. Yeah, so, okay. I'm just trying to see how it fits in there. Yeah, they all need to have secondary access points. Okay, and that's part of this, this zoning, or maybe that's with the actual builder to have the ownership of the, a portion of the light, provide a portion of the light to us as well. Let me Mayor, if I may, Councilman Hampton, actually all of the obligations for the infrastructure improvements, all the roadways around Ballpark Village and Ballpark Village South, the D-cell lanes, the traffic signals, that was all established with the original PAD back in 2007. So that has all carried through all those oh. obligations every time something gets approved. And then when the actual traffic is happening and the warrants exist, mm -hmm. then those lights get put in. So that's why that one particular light isn't in yet. But now with all of this development happening there, the warrants will come. Okay. So yeah, because I know this, the council, right before I got on, they, they rezoned this area to multifamily. So I was just curious. How it how what changed? So thank you, Laura. Thank you, Mayor. Well, as the newest council member, I uh, played a little catch up with Christopher on Friday because I didn't know what the vision and the different iterations were. So it was very helpful uh, catching up on things. I just want to say I like that there's a diversity of uh, products that they aren't going to all look the same. Each one will have its own flavor. And we definitely are creating a little village there, which will hopefully will spur some commercial in the part that is allocated for commercial. Uh, and so I, I, I don't have any objections to, to the proposal. Thank you. Bill, you had something additional? Just because Hugh's in the room. <laughs> if we're going to put another traffic light. <laughs> oh, here he goes again. Oh, my gosh. Yes. There's a lot of lights in that little section. Hugh, please, when you do the new software, connect these ones together so they all turn red at the same time and they all turn green at the same time. And give Bill a special you. button. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wouldn't have said anything, but I saw you sitting there. So. Oh, no. Oh, my God. Well, I'm last to speak as always, uh, but I'm, I'm real pleased with it. And I think really we're building tourism there. Mm -hmm. I, we may have to rename it, you know. I, well, I guess the reds won't be reds anymore, but whatever it is. And, and mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that that is the vision and it was, um, was multifamily or more people around that. This is a big attraction. Uh, we're spending a lot of money on this on this stadium, mm -hmm. and and it deserves it. I did see uh, in that one drawing uh, stores. I saw awning had a little sign up there. Is that a teaser, or will that possibly come? Um, there it is. There it is. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yes, it is. And, and, and I'm gonna speak on myself again here. Um, unfortunately, no, those are not commercial areas in the bottom of the building, but they certainly and why look can't like those it. Be? Well, what they are going to have in there are all of their, and zoning is the major issue. It's not zoned for commercial development, but they're going to use that first floor area for their meeting spaces, for their group sure. kitchens, for sure. their gym, for all their public spaces, sure. for the residents. But we wanted to make it what looks like a retail appearance on the street. Well, we got a real high from that, so <laughs> I just want you to know that, but I understand. I understand the reasoning. Beautiful. Any other questions? Let's do roll call, please. Vice Mayor Stiff? Aye. Council Member Loritano? Aye. Council Member Campbell? Aye. Council Member Hampton? Aye. Council Member Kano? Aye. Council Member Pizzillo? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. All right, we're on to business number six. I'd like to remind Council again to wait for the motion second before discussion. First item on business to consider um, approving. Mayor, I, there's an ordinance on there as well. Get a book for the ordinance. Thank you. Oh, I missed it. Um, so we're just going to vote for it, though. I have to read it and then the motion. Oh, would you second. read it, please? Sorry, I missed that. So adopt ordinance number 2021-1494, conditionally rezoning approximately 254.5 gross acres located 
on the east side of Estrella Parkway between West Goodyear Boulevard and South and Bullard Avenue to amend certain res category multifamily development standards in the restated and amended final planned area development for Ballpark Village and Ballpark Village South. Amending the zoning map of the city of Goodyear, providing for non-abridgement, correction, severability, and effective date and penalties. Thank you. Do I hear a motion and a second to approve this? So moved. Second. Was that? No. Okay. Laura Kano was the motion. Second was? Laura, uh, sure. Laura, sure. thank you. All right. Open for council discussion. I'm sure it's done. All right. Let's do a roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stipp? Aye. Council Member Campbell? Aye. Council Member Hampton? Aye. Council Member Kano? Aye. Councilmember Pazillo? Aye. Councilmember Lortano? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. All right, now we'll go to business. And I'd like to remind you to wait till the motion and the second is given. The first item on the business, number six, is to consider approving the 2021 spring payment, payment management projects. So we're going to be hearing from our engineering department. All right, good evening, Mayor, members of Council. I'm Hugh Biak, City Traffic Engineer, and with me this evening is Brian Harville, our Pavement Management Coordinator. And tonight we'll be presenting our fiscal year 2021 Spring Pavement Management Projects. Just give you a, a quick agenda of what we'll be discussing this evening. Uh, first, we'll go over our fall and winter projects from this past fiscal year. And following that, we'll go through our treatments for fiscal year or for the spring fiscal year 2021. And then we'll uh, go over the treatment locations and then we will uh, close with a recommendation. On this slide in front of you shows the status of our uh, fiscal year 2021 fall and winter projects that were approved back in set, no October, my mistake. Of uh, the six items here, the top three are still in progress and the, the bottom three have been completed. Uh, the first one across the top, the roadway preparation ADA ramps, that is still in progress along with our crack seal and our pavement data inventory. Our pavement data inventory is uh, running uh, below or under budget. We're anticipating a savings of $60,000. And then along the bottom three, the first one is our Rainbow Valley Road surface preparation, which has been completed with a savings of $300. Our high volume fast with scrub seal with a savings of $112,600. And then our low volume cape seal, which again is completed and with a savings of $300 for an overall project savings from the fall and winter projects of $173,200. And now I'll turn it over to Brian who will be discussing our treatments. Brian. Good evening, <coughs> excuse me. Good evening, Mayor and Council. We'll have two treatments being applied this spring, FY21. The first is asphalt microsurfacing this product is designed to reestablish the surface wearing course and minimize cracking on arterial and high volume collector streets. The example here is a McDowell Road looking north from Bullard applied in spring of 2020. I'm sorry, it's looking east from Bullard. Second treatment will be an asphalt slurry seal. This material is designed to reestablish the surface wearing course and minimum cra minimize cracking on residential surface streets. This example is from Canyon Trails Phase 1 applied in 2017. Now we'll look at the project maps. This is the northern portion of the project, which includes a microsurfacing on Bullard Avenue from McDowell Road to Van Buren, <clears throat> we will be applying a slurry seal to Palm Valley Phase 9 community, which is a little tiny neighborhood at the very northern bottom. In the central area of the city, <clears throat> again, you'll see the microsurfacing being applied to Bullard Avenue. And then we have another section of Bullard Avenue that will receive a micro seal from Lower Buckeye Parkway to Australia Parkway. Canyon Trails Boulevard from Lower Buckeye to Yuma Road 
173rd Avenue from Yuma Road to Van Buren Street, Harrison Street from 173rd Avenue to Citrus, and a Lilac Street from 173rd Avenue to Cotton Lane. We will be applying a slurry seal to the areas in Canyon Trails, Vanderbilt Farms, Curtis Commons, and Legacy Ranch. <clears throat> and Astoria Mountain Ranch will be applying a microsurfacing to San Gabriel Drive, West Star Drive, Golf Club Drive, Calistoga Drive, and the, mo and the westmost section of Elliott Road. We will also be applying a slurry seal to a large number of residential areas as noted on the map. At this point, I'll hand the presentation back to Hugh to finish up. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, the cost summary for our fiscal year 2021 spring pavement management projects are for asphalt microsurfacing in the amount of $1 million dollars and asphalt slurry seal in the amount of $600,000 for an overall spring project total of $1,600,000. So tonight our staff recommendation is to approve expenditures in the amount of $1,600,000 to complete our fiscal year 2021 spring pavement management projects in various locations throughout the city. And with that, I'd like to, or uh, happy to handle any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. What did I mean? All the audience, our audience disappeared, but there is one that could wish to speak. All right. Then can I have a motion and a second to approve the expenditures in the amount of $1,600,000 to complete pavement management projects in the various locations throughout the city? Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. I hear a motion from Vice Mayor Stiff and a second from Council Bazillo. Open for Council discussion. Councilman Bazillo. When you're filling in those cracks, how, what type of warranty comes on? And the reason why I'm asking that is I'm in Trevisia, okay? And when I went and sealed those cracks, oh, I don't know when, it didn't take long before they started opening up again. In other words, the road a cracked. And I, and I thought there were certain warranties on there. And again, I don't remember when they actually did have uh, specific roads. But it didn't seem to last very long, as I've seen a lot of the other um, neighborhoods where once you put the stuff down, it, it lasts quite a while. But uh, there's sizable gaps in the street itself. So how do you, uh, as a follow-up, how do you uh, determine, and I, I think you have a rating system for those that are listening, you know, um, live or, or watching us on Facebook, whatever the case may be, how do you determine? You have a rating system on these on which neighborhood you pick and, and how you go about it. Just high level, not to get in a whole lot of detail for those understanding how they do, how you select which ones you're doing. So normally for, um, let's say, get this closer. Um, Excuse me. <laughs> um, so normally what, your area actually received what's called a low volume cape seal. Um, that is where we go in and we apply a chip seal and come back on top of that and apply, well, I'm sorry, first we crack seal the cracks, then we apply the chip seal. And then on top of that, we apply a slurry seal. That area is normally anywhere between 50 and 65 PCI, uh, pavement condition index. Um, you're going to see cracks, unfortunately, but with, with that process, uh, there is going to be significant cracking on those streets already as it is a, a lower PCI. Um, we can minimize cracking and we can try to prevent the alligator areas, but your longer, wider cracks are going to come back. My goal is to try to narrow those, make those less wide when they do come back and have the ability to crack seal them again. Okay, yeah, I'm just curious. It didn't take long for them to open back up again. So. It, and they will. Um, you have a flexible material, and on top of that, we're putting a rigid material. And so those cracks are going to flex back and forth. Your surface isn't going to flex. It's going to give. I understand. Any other comments? Brandon? 
No, I, I appreciate the presentation. I mean, this is definitely, everybody likes driving on fresh, or nice, beautiful asphalt. So it definitely adds a lot to our community, I mean, the condition of our streets, the feel of our community. So I do appreciate that. And then, yeah, I know especially out by on Elliott Road, heading out the far west, that, that road definitely could use some help there. So I appreciate that as well. And then um, what's the time, is the timeline just this year? I know it's spring pavement management, but is it the entire year? When will, when will this whole project you foresee being complete? So uh, micro seal is tentatively scheduled to begin in mid-April, and it should finish up in towards the end of April, early May. Uh, slurry seal is tentatively scheduled to begin mid-May, and then finish up early June. All right, great, yeah, so we'll see that for you pretty quickly then so yeah that's all the questions I had so thank you I, I obviously I, this is a great program I like that you keep up on it and I think it needs to continue so thank you Wally thank you um, for the three programs that you say are in progress now when are they going to be completed uh, those will be completed by June uh, 30th of this fiscal year. They, by the end of the fiscal year, they will be completed. And then they'll be complete, and then you'll start the, the new ones we're talking about tonight. Uh, those will actually run uh, along with okay. the program. So all three of those programs are already in progress. Um, the data collection program is... I don't know if anybody was able to see some of the, the high-tech van driving around the roads um, in no, the last No, but I saw a Google, Google car yesterday. <laughs> this one looks like a Google car. Well, I don't know. So, he had a camera on the top, and it said Google Roads or Google apps, Streets, yeah. and he was driving all around. So th this is similar to that with the cameras on all the sides, and plus they have the high-definition equipment that will actually measure the cracks, count the cracks, and then feed that back. So that process is complete. Now we go into a three month or a two month long process of collecting all that data together and then sending that back to us and, and implementing that onto the city's Lucidity uh, asset management software. So, but at the same time, it'll, it'll continue running while we're still doing the rest of the projects all at once. Everything will be completed by the end of the fiscal year. Well, that's good to know. And it's also good to know for the residents to know that we're always looking and taking a, a look at all of the streets so that we can determine what streets are next. And yes. that's important. Does the slurry and the micro surfacing really last five to seven years? The surface does. You will see cracks. cracks. Um, like I said, I'm doing my, we, we do our best to minimize um, and we will probably crack seal over top of it during that lifespan um, once or twice. The slurry surface um, does remain five to seven years. Uh, a good example of that would be Indian School Road. Yes. Uh, from Pebble Creek to, uh, I believe it's Falcon. Uh, that was done actually 11 years ago, and it's still got a very tight uh, micro seal surface, but you do see some residual crack. I'm surprised it's, it has lasted that long with the volume of traffic now on that road, as well as the trucks, too. So that's great. Oh. So thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Yes, ma'am. Bill? You know, I think that uh, kind of begs the question when we, we talk about this program. This, this, is, this has been going on for almost as long as we've been on council. Can you talk a little bit about this being an ongoing, you know, it, it, at times it sounds like this is a, a one and done kind of program, but this is in fact, it's just a repetitive. So can you guys talk about that? Sure. Sure. Uh, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, um, this project, we, we began, I believe, the payment management, or the, yeah, the payment <coughs> management program, I believe we started doing it annually in 2014, I believe, was about the year of fiscal have yeah, we talked about it in 13 and the existing program as it exists now started in 2013 or I'm sorry 2014 so around 2014 and again we come back to you every year this year was a little bit different year as we had some contracts that expired for these two particular surface treatments these contracts expired I believe it was in November so we're not able to bring them before you typically in the past these will be these were brought just once a year usually in September brought before council for approval. This year we had to split it up. We had to do a fall and winter and then a spring version, which we're here for today. But again, 
uh, from here forward for at least the next five years, I believe the contracts are five years, we'll be back to just once a year. We'll be back to you uh, in the late summer, early fall, and just present this to you once for your approval. But yes, it's an ongoing project every year. Every year we uh, generate the, uh, the, uh, the uh, maps or the projects throughout the city based on our funding allocation. And we try to maximize the city's dollar in, uh, in trying to, because uh, we don't do the same treatment every year. We try to maximize the volume or the amount we do of a certain product to get a, 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 a volume savings, so to speak so that we can maximize the city seller. So that's why some years, you know, you may not see a micro seal, you may not see a cape seal, you know, that may be a three year lag or so. It just depends how we can batch those program or those certain treatments together and uh, maximize the city's dollar. And I think that that's important for the public to understand that this isn't just a one-time thing that we really made a very conscious effort to make sure that the streets are in a condition that um, are, are very high in, in quality and, and, you know, to support the, the transportation network that we've created. So I appreciate the, the, the explanation. The only other comment that I have uh, that saves me an email, Hugh, is I want to thank you for uh, the work that you've done on the traffic lights that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Um, it is significantly better. And thank you very much for that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not, I, I'm not saying anything about it, I promise. I <laughs> um, and you know, you were the use the word savings. I hope the public heard that because that's the one that highlighted uh, for me. Um, because um, and it's always hard for somebody that's never been in that business to walk out and see um, the ceiling. You think it's going to be all one color all the way through, and that's our expectation. And that's one thing I've learned since I've been on the council and remembered that it's not going to happen unless somebody's going to invent something that's just absolutely marvelous. Um, but you do a, a good job, and it's a difficult. We have a lot of city now. And with the weather, the sunlight, I'm sure there's a lot of damage and drying out of things. So good job. And uh, we appreciate everybody that's out in the hot weather. Now it's a little cooler, but come wet, warm weather, I don't know how the team can stand that. It is working on something like that. So it's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay, have any additions done? Can we, can we have all, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. The next item of business is to consider approving the submittal of an application for staffing for the adequate fire emergency response, which I guess is safer grant. Our own police chief, will be, our fire chief will be presenting. Good evening, Mayor and Council, Paul Luizzi, fire chief. Um, as you stated, Mayor, we'll be going over uh, the um, safer grant tonight. So we'll do a quick overview for you. We'll also include a timeline, which includes the construction for Fire Station 188, and then obviously uh, any questions that you may have. So the Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response Grants is a federal grant program. Provides funding directly to the department to help uh, increase and maintain the number of trained frontline firefighters. So it pays for only operational firefighter positions. These are only new positions, uh, salary and benefits for firefighters during their initial recruit training. It also pay, pays for the Fair Labor Standards Act or the FLSA overtime, which is a federal law that we have to abide by. So um, anytime they reach a certain threshold and they work over that, then we pay them overtime. This is a reimbursable grant. So as the city expends the money, the grant is reimbursed. And you can pick uh, your when you want to have the money reimbursed to you. So most cities that I've talked to, they actually get it on a quarterly basis if that's what the city chooses to do. But we can certainly have that conversation uh, as we head into that uh, process. Uh, the last couple of years, city match is not required for this grant. 
previously they did have matches that were required. In the last two years, they have not had that um, requirement. And so 100% of salary and benefits are covered for 36 months. We'll talk about some ineligible expenses. So any pre-application cost, admin cost, uh, anything with uh, onboarding. So their backgrounds, their medicals, uh, psych tests, all those uh, would be borne by the city. And any cost to train or equip the firefighters would be um, taken on by the city. So here's a look at the timeline. So the application deadline is actually March 12th, and so staff has been working uh, very hard on this application. Um, it, once you get it submitted, um, May and September are the award periods. So the first round would be at the end of May, and the latest that the awards would come out is at the end of September. So for example, City of Avondale received a safer grant last year, and they they received it around September. So there's really no telling in that window of when you would get it, but that is a, a, you know, a five month window that you're eligible for. Between August and December is the recruitment period. So that's 180 days. So from the time you were awarded the grant, when you can start recruiting those firefighters specifically for that grant. Uh, November 2021 would be the earliest the grant performance period can begin. So if we were awarded first, first round in May, then the earliest the grant performance period would begin would be in November of this year. Uh, we are anticipating right now a January 2022 Academy start date for us. And then a spring of 2022 uh, graduation. So about a 14, 15 week uh, Academy that they would be in. Uh, once they graduate, we will double staff again, Fire Station 184 with the Fire Station 188 crew. Uh, we are anticipating the opening of um, Fire Station 181 to be in April of this year, so just uh, another eight weeks away. And then we anticipate winter uh, 22, early 23, that Fire Station 188 would open. So again, this is a 180-day recruit, uh, recruitment period. So you cannot have uh, any type of recruitment that occurs prior to the award of the SAFER grant. So we could not start a recruitment now and then have a list. That was something that we were actually hoping for, but you actually have to start the recruitment after you are approved for the award. Uh, so as I stated before, the duration or the performance period is 36 months and it begins immediately after the 180 days uh, has ended. You can ask for it to begin prior to the 180 days. Uh, for instance, Avondale, when they went through their process last year, uh, their recruitment and the academy started prior to the 180 days ending. So they asked for the money a little bit early, which is really not a big issue at all. There are no extensions to the period of the performance, any delays in filling the positions may lead to unexpended grant funds. Some other conditions that uh, exist. Operational staffing levels must be maintained at the level they existed at the time of the award. So what do we have today for firefighters? We have to have at the end of the grant period. Uh, so this is in addition to the, the safer grant funded positions. Uh, applies to the entire 36 months. We also must take an active and timely step to backfill any operational vacancies, which we do anyways. Uh, so there's really no concern there from, from my perspective. And the governing body, you, must be aware of, the, of these staffing requirements. So what happens if we aren't successful? Uh, so we have submitted um, a uh, budget request, supplemental, uh, that for July of 2021, uh, that re requests the staff for the next fiscal year, which would begin in July. Uh, we would start uh, our recruitment in January of 2022, um, either spring or early summer academy for the new recruits. They would graduate sometime in the fall. We would double house them for a short period of time at Fire Station uh, 184. And then uh, in the winter of 22 or early 23, Fire Station 188 would open. 
I am available for any questions you may have on this presentation. Thank you very much. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? All right, will the city clerk please read resolution 2021-2136 by title only? Adopt resolution number 2021-2136 authorizing the submission of an application for the staffing for adequate fire and emergency response safer program funds to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, authorizing the city manager to execute all documents relating to said application and authorizing the city manager to execute a grant agreement if funds are awarded and authorizing the city manager to approve the required budget transfer if grant funds are awarded. Thank you. Can I have a motion a second to approve resolution number 2021-2136? Do I hear that motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion from Councilman Laura Tano, a second by Councilman Pazillo. Open for council discussion. Please. Yes, I'll take the bill. What is the count or the count of firefighters that typically the, the grant will cover? So we would be asking for 15 firefighters. Okay. So uh, the normal amount to staff stations on three shifts would be 12. And we're asking for three rovers in addition to that. So to cover backfill for injuries, um, illness, vacation, et cetera. So. so if it's approved, you've got money for three years. Correct. 36 months. Yep, is the performance period. If it's not approved, you got it in this budget coming up, I assume, right? That's correct. Okay. So if it's approved, I would assume, I don't finance director's not here, but I would assume if it's approved, we have a tendency to put money aside a little bit at a time to make sure that in the three years when that yeah. grant goes away, that you're not looking for 15. Correct. To fund 15 to firefighters because that money is already there set aside, used as one time money. Is, is that accurate, uh, city manager? That's correct. Okay. We would work with finance right. to make sure that. Yeah. Thank you. Councilman Lower Town. I mean, Kano. <laughs> Have we used this grant now. before? We have not. No, there. Um, some of our neighbors that have been successful, surprise, most recently, Avondale last year uh, in Scottsdale. Actually, not that they're a neighbor, but they are one of our benchmark cities. So they've all been successful in their Okay, no downsides to it that, that they could see. So it looks like it would get people hired in quicker and through academy sooner, and then you'd have more training time, I guess, before they... Yeah, we'd have a little bit more lead-up time uh, if if we went through the grant process. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, Thank you. Sure. Vice Mayor. Chief, in your uh, slide deck, if you can go back. Sure. This is if it's unsuccessful. Can you go to the successful slide? I'm sorry. Uh, that one. Go one more slide. I just want to make sure we're on this. Forward or backward? Forward, I'm sorry. Okay, so in this particular timeline, we're talking about um, with a successful grant, they graduate the academy in the spring of 22, Correct. and they'll, we will, the theory is we'll staff an additional truck for almost a whole year, whatever spring is and whatever winter is. That's why, I'm, I'm, you know, spring could be March. Well, yeah, so. Winter okay. could be February. Right, right, right. So, <laughs> yeah, so we're anticipating a January, February academy. So you figure 14, 15 weeks from that point. So typically it's an April or May graduation. So it would be more like a late spring, early summer for us graduation. And then... Uh, we anticipate our goal is to anticipate that the station would be open by December, late December, early January um, time frame. So, so given so we, six months, seven months. Yeah. yeah it, and it could slide could one slide. way because of construction delays Correct. or whatever. My, my question is in the, um, can't we use that additional staff to save overtime during that period? and not put another truck up? I'm not asking you to commit to anything, but I'm just kind of throwing it out there. Yeah, it, it would be similar to the concept we had with 186, where we staffed that vehicle as though we would staff any other vehicle in our fleet. Right. So, And I think from a procedural perspective, that made sense because we had a second vehicle up in Australia Mountain Ranch where we don't have, you know, the, the nearest 
res uh, secondary response is so far away. Right. In the situation of 188, it's really not. And they're they're coming out of the station 184. So I'm I'm trying to take advantage of the additional staffing and maybe reduce some overtime costs for the first six months of this before we get into going down that road. And um, as we talked about during the retreat, our our over maybe not during the retreat. Our overtime costs for public safety are quite high, both police and fire. And if we can take advantage of the federal money to staff the folks and then take and then a secondary benefit of reducing overtime for even a six month period, we're saving the taxpayers quite a bit of money sure. um, that we can take advantage of that. And I, I would encourage both you and the manager to to really look at that instead of standing up the other truck yeah. um, for that period of time. Yeah, we'll have to look at, you know, obviously there's a lot of rules <laughs> that go in along to the grant. So just make sure that we're not violating anything that could be potentially uh, an issue for us. But yeah, I definitely will work with the finance and, and the city manager's office on that. And then finally, if we, I think it's part of the normal communication, if we get this grant, we'll, we'll be notified, I presume. Okay. Yeah. That was all I had, but I appreciate you going for it. Thank you. Councilman Campbell. Okay, my, my question is really simple. Where is going to be 188 located? Harrison and Citrus. So Canyon, just Canyon Trails. Okay. Having them staffed at 184 makes sense because it's yes. basically West. the same yeah. area. Um, but will they, once they pass uh, the academy and they come on staff and they're actually our firefighters with their own truck, will they answer calls? Oh, of course, yeah. They'll be working just like they're normal. Yeah, they're actually, they'll be assigned the 188 moniker out of that station. Perfect. And they'll get picked up for, for calls. Yep. <coughs> and just getting the grant will help us just get them on staff earlier. Correct. Very good. Thank you. Yes, Sherry? Uh, Chief, thank you very much. I know we've been asking for grants for a while and seeing what's out there, so I really do appreciate you guys taking all the effort. I know it takes a lot of work mm -hmm. to put these together and everything, mm -hmm. but this could save a lot of money for the next yeah. three years, right? Three years, three, yeah, 36 months, yes. Basically, it, it takes care of that station for the three-year period. It yeah. gives us funding for that. So, yes. yeah. so I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, Brandon? I'd say thank you for pursuing uh, the grant. I, I think it'll be, it's a no-brainer. I think it'll be good for the community and, and good for uh, our budget and everything else. So thank you. Any other questions? Let's have roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stiff? Aye. Council Member Hampton? Aye. Council Member Kano? Aye. Council Member Pizzello? Aye. Council Member Loritano? Aye. Council Member Campbell? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. We're at number eight item on business to consider approving the donation of a surplus 2014 Chevrolet t Tahoe to the Buckeye Valley Fire. Chief, you're on again. Back again. Paul Louisi, Fire Chief. Good evening, Mayor and Council. <laughs> Uh, so tonight we are asking you to adopt a resolution which would authorize the city manager to approve the donation of a surplus 2014 Chevy Tahoe to the Buckeye Valley Fire District. This vehicle would directly support the district's tourism liaison program or their TLO program. The Buckeye Valley Fire District obviously borders the city's uh, city of Goodyear to the west and responds to Goodyear through the automatic aid system. The vehicle will greatly enhance their TLO program. So Fleet currently has possession of this Chevy Tahoe was actually replaced due to age, miles, and overall condition. The Tahoe um, did once at one time belong to PD. It's seven years old and has over 100,000 miles. It is unmarked and it was actually replaced in the FY 2021 budget year with another Tahoe. Current procurement policy permits the donation of this vehicle as described. Public safety and fleet services are not negatively impacted by this donation. The Buckeye Valley Fire District enthusiastically supports, and they really are very happy, <laughs> uh, the offer of this donation in the vehicle would fit the needs of their TLO program. The alternative consideration to this would be to send this vehicle to auction if the vehicle did go to auction, we would anticipate uh, collecting anywhere between five and six thousand dollars. So, any questions for me regarding this donation? No, I don't think so. No. Thank you very much. All right. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? Will the city clerk please read resolution number twenty 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 one twenty one thirty seven by title only, please? 
adopt resolution number 2021-2137 approving the execution of an agreement providing for the donation of the city's surplus 2014 Chevrolet Tahoe to the Buckeye Valley Fire District for use in the Terrorism Liaison Officer Program. Thank you. Can I have a motion, a second, to approve resolution number 2021-2137? Do I hear that motion? So, so moved. I've heard a motion from Vice Mayor Stiff and a second, second. from Councilman Campbell. Open for council discussion. All right, I think we've had that, so roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stiff? Aye. Council Member Cano? Aye. Council Member Pizzillo? Aye. Council Member Loritano? Aye. Council Member Campbell? Aye. Council Member Hampton? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. The next item, number nine of business, is consider approving the APS Three Rivers 20, 230 KV transmission line project. We'll be hearing from our engineer. Introduce yourself, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Can you hear me okay? Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Sumit Mohan. I am the Director of Engineering, and I'll be presenting to you tonight the APS 3 Reverse 230 kilovolts transmission line project. You have heard about this from my predecessor, Rebecca, uh, on a few occasions. So today is sort of a, a completion uh, of that dialogue. Just to give you an idea, this is all about the energy plan for our city's growth. We are growing rapidly and we have to keep up with our energy demands. So on the map, you will see APS substations as they exist uh, in the Southwest Valley. So all the oranges are existing stations, substations, and the greens are the new substations that are uh, currently in the process of being designed. In this case, for the 230 kilovolt transmission line for three rivers. Uh, walking you through, through the timeline, when it started uh, last year, uh, about 13 months ago, when APS announced that they wanted to go through this project to serve a new data center, which is near Bullard Avenue and Van Buren. Uh, APS held two public meetings on February 19th and February 20th in Goodyear and in Avondale. Uh, as the time moved on in the month of July, between July 1st and August 1st, APS f held their first ever virtual open house, uh, which surprised them as to the amount of participation that they got. They sent uh, electronic notifications to 77,000 folks and sent 30,000 public newsletters by mail. More than 2,000 people visited the open house, which was a record for them by a factor of four times compared to other public hearings like these. And 17 people responded to the questionnaire. So you can see that a lot of people gave a lot of interest and input into this process. So our citizens have been very involved and engaged in this process. Uh, moving forward, in the end of September of 2020, APS sat down with us and with the city of Goodyear and we reviewed seven alternative route align alignments with them. At that meeting, we asked APS to realign the segment that is uh, near GMC. Uh, they were initially on the east side of our buildings. We requested them to move the alignment to the west with certain reasons. Number one, we wanted them to be away from our regional wireless cooperative radio tower and also we wanted them to be closer in alignment to our new and upcoming data center project, which is making really good progress. And APS complied with our requests and understood the value of our comments. Uh, moving right along, uh, it's already March. So here, right now APS is uh, getting ready for the Certificate of Environmental Compatibility, which is something they have to do with the Arizona Corporation Commission especially the Power Plant and Transmission Line Siting Committee. APS has already completed the review of all the public comments. They have identified their preferred route and two alternative routes. Right now, they have reached out to all the stakeholders, including us, and also City of Avondale, ADOT, Flood Control District, Federal Aviation Administration, and all, so that we can all look at these routes and provide any final comments. Um, the preferred alternative is the one you can see in the blue lining. This is something that APS has finally proposing. They are finally proposing for the final uh, alternative, uh, the preferred route. 
Also, there's an alternate one, which is very similar, not much different at all. And alternate two, again, very similar. The only nuances are slight differences in the way they cross uh, uh, I-10. Other than that, these three routes are the ones that APS is going to go through. Uh, just to give you an idea of what the typical 230 kilovolt poles look like. So the one that you are seeing on the left this is the one that is typically for single circuit, 230 kilovolt, with a, which is 230 kilovolt here, and a single circuit, uh, 69 kilovolt underbuilt here, or it can be a double circuit. So you can have an, uh, one circuit here and the other here for 230 kilovolts, and also double circuit for 69 kilovolts. Typically, this, these can be anywhere from 115 to 195 feet high, depending on the terrain. Also, to give you an idea of what they look like in real life, the single, single circuit monopole with the 230 looks like this. In this case, there is no 69 kilovolt uh, underneath. In this case, you see double circuit uh, of 230 kilovolt and also double circuit 69 kilovolt underneath, just to give you an idea. With that said, uh, APS has already worked very closely with us, followed all our uh, requests. So at this point, uh, we are requesting that the council approve uh, the three routes that APS is planning to take to the siting committee in April. Thank you very much. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? Uh, can I have a motion and second to approve the third route as reflected in exit F2, attached here to, and the two alternate routes as reflected in ex ex exhibits three and four, attached here to, for the 230 kV transmission lines that APS plans to bring before the Arizona Power Plant and Transmission Line Sitting Committee in April 21. Do I hear that motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion from Vice Mayor Stiff and a second from Councilman Kano. Open for council discussion. Just one thing. Yeah. Council, uh, Vice Mayor. We have had a lot of communication just for the public. We've had a lot of communication from APS on this, a number of, I regretfully, Zoom meetings on, on this subject. So we don't have a lot of questions regarding it because uh, APS has done uh, a real good job of this and the future lines that are coming before us. So thank you for the presentation tonight. Any thank other? you, Vice Mayor. I have to agree. It's been a real good partnership mm -hmm. with uh, APS. They've done an excellent job. So have we. So, all right. So let's vote on this. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you very much. On number 10, the last item is to consider approving the development agreement at for at-risk permits for development civic square. Oh, okay. Yeah, you've got the, some of you have the audience again. George. Th thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, I don't have a presentation for this next item. But it is basically we are requesting uh, Mayor and Council to please approve our request for a development agreement that we have drafted uh, to be entered into with Globe Corporation, who are our public-private partners, so that we can issue at-risk foundation-only permits to Ryan Corporation, who is the design builder mm -hmm. on this project. We just had some hiccups because of another of our partners on the water wastewater side where they gave some misleading information to the design firm due to which there is a scheduled risk on the project. And on all our projects, we like to be within budget and uh, follow the schedule. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to take a chance on a scheduled slip. So we found this creative, innovative route where we can hopefully issue these at-risk foundation-only permits to keep the project on overall schedule. Absolutely. Thank you. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? Will the city clerk please read resolution number 2021-2142 by title only? Adopt resolution number 2021-2142 approving the development agreement for at-risk permits for development of Civic Square, providing authorization and direction to take actions and execute documents necessary to carry out the intent of the resolution and development agreement and providing for an effective date. Thank you. Can I have a motion a second to approve resolution number 2021-2142? Do I hear that motion? So moved. I have second. a motion by Councilman Canfield, a motion and a second by Councilman Hampton. Open for council discussion. No discussion. Roll call vote, please. 
Vice Mayor Stipp? Aye. Council Member Pozzillo? Aye. Council Member Loritano? Aye. Council Member Campbell? Aye. Council Member Hampton? Aye. Council Member Kino? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. All right, we're now on information. Does Council have any comments or accommodation reports you'd like to give this evening? All right, then I'm going to ask the city manager. Do you have anything you'd like to speak to us about? I do, Mayor and Council. I actually have a number of items I'd like to share. First, I'd like to do a recap of our um, ballpark opening day yesterday. Um, so the 2021 spring training season kicked off on Sunday, and we welcomed eager fans, and I just wanted to share some highlights. We did officially have a sold-out crowd uh, within the existing capacity that we were able to, to safely have of 2,211 fans. Um, the Indians' proceeds from the game will benefit Hope Team, and the Reds' proceeds will benefit the New Life Center. We did have a number of safety protocols in place to protect the fans, players and staff, which included limiting the attendance, contact, contactless systems such as mobile ticketing and ordering concessions online. Overall, we did receive positive feedback. I know it was windy and cold, but there was a positive feedback for the experience and our fans were happy to be back in the stands to watch a game. To date, 20 of our 28 games are sold out. So wow. limited tickets remain for some select games. Good news. I'd also like to address um, some uh, current event, which is that we've seen um, heavy upstream water flow from agricultural areas north of Goodyear into the Bullard Wash over the past few weeks. Um, in the city of Goodyear, our existing lines um, have been working as designed, but the flow and the velocity of the tailwater we're receiving um, makes the water go into its overflow, which again is, is designed. So we ideally like all the water to go into the 24 inch pipe and it stays underground, but it is designed because it's a wash to handle the, to handle the overflow. Our city line was inspected in December and found to be uh, free and operating um, as it should. We also have contractors go out twice a day to clean the grates off of the systems because the water that's coming to us is not necessarily clean. It has a lot of debris and branches and, and such that can clog up the systems. And so it's being well maintained. It is working um, as it should. But we also know that there's disruption to some of our neighborhoods. Um, the surface flows have reached Pebble Creek and closed, um, caused closure of their wash crossings. Um, as of this morning, the flows had subsided, um, but about 1 o'clock, 1.30, they were back to being overflow. So the farmers have the right and you know to release this water into these systems. Um, they are unpredictable. There's no set patterns. We've we've looked into that, um, and we have no simply amount of we have no control over the amount of tail water that is generated. Uh, but we did want to say we understand how frustrating this is. We work closely with the Pebble Creek HOA um, to do everything we can to you know disrupt those um, you know inconveniences to that to that neighborhood and the team. Uh, we've been meeting you know daily during this. Uh, time again to see what it is that we can do and, and how to best manage the flows. But we wanted to acknowledge that there are, are high flows right now and that we are working diligently to, to manage it the best we can. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Bill. Did Pebble Creek make its improvements that they were supposed to? So um, we, we've been in contact with the Pebble Creek community. I believe that they've done some scoping of their lines. Um, they've not otherwise, to my knowledge, made any improvements. I know that there's been conversations from some of the residents, for example, that, you know, perhaps that a bridge should be built or, you know, what is it that can, that can be done? Uh, I don't know if Javier, you want to, if there's any additional information, but... Yeah, so we, we know that their, their lines are operational. We had the flows... Um, over the last couple of days, go all the way down to the Rio Paseo Park. So, I mean, there, there's just simply a lot of water coming through the system, um, you know, and, and we believe the system is working as best it can. Long term, you'd have to make some pretty significant changes to the system itself if you wanted it to always handle the flows that were possible. And is Pebble Creek looking at that right now, the HOA? Um, I think that they are aware of their options. I'm not sure what their plan is. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure from a from an information standpoint that the residents in Pebble Creek realize that our site is working like it's supposed to be working. And um, I just want to make sure that information gets out there to them. 
I'm yeah, sure, and Wally's, I, and I'm sure I, Wally's making sure that information is <laughs> getting out there. Too. Well, the, and the, if I could, there were some rumors, and uh, you know, we were working through some of the social media channels to try to dispel some of the rumors. There was one that we had a cistern or something that we had emptied into the wash, and you know, so trying to get good information out there is is important. These are right. natural flows coming from the farmlands north of Goodyear, and they have the right to to discharge their flows into the wash. And, and what's so frustrating is that in years past, we've never had that much water come down. And either the farmers are not using the water, but they're still taking their allocation and they're allowing it to flow down the Bullard Wash. And that's what's frustrating to our residents. And when our washes get flooded, we are cut off from the north side of Pebble Creek. We have to go out the gates, go around two miles to come in the other gate to go do whatever we normally do when we're just going through the, the the property but they do they are working on it is is what i understand um it's just unfortunate we don't have bridges yeah I, that's what i agree i think the construction of pebble <coughs> creek um both you know both of those areas that flood <clears throat> i think that um and of course i'm sure when that was built remember that was the first community the big community we had in goodyear and I'm sure at that time, uh, the cost uh, probably affect them, but maybe maybe the engineer didn't catch it. So it could be right from the very beginning. I can see how that happens. It's unfortunate that the gossip gets going and the things that they say, and we do answer everything that comes into our office, um, but the point is they just don't believe it. So um, I think we just have to take the the uh, you know the conversation we just have to keep working at it that's all we can only do what we can do thank you and mayor i had two, two additional items yeah so just a, a reminder of upcoming events we do have the special election on march 9th um, ballots must be returned uh, by march 9th to city hall which serves as a ballot replacement center as well so you can drop off your ballots uh, during normal business hours monday through friday eight to five and we'll have special hours of operation on Saturday, March 6th from 8 to 5, and on Tuesday, which is Election Day, ballots can be dropped off as late as 7 p.m. Uh, one final item is we've been working um, with the Maricopa Association of Governments and partnership with the City of Avondale to do the Avondale Goodyear Transit Study. So over the last several months, MAG and the consultant have sent out surveys and hold, held virtual shareholder meetings to develop transit options that may provide additional mobility options for residents and employers in our city. So we're nearing the finish line, but we do have two additional public outreach meetings, which will be held virtually to receive final input. And these meetings will be held on Thursday, March 4th from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. and Wednesday, March 10th from 5 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. The consulting team will provide a series of transit service concepts, including potential modifications to existing transit routes, flexible employment shuttles, microtransit, and multimodal mobility hubs. Uh, for information about the study and the links and passcodes to attend the meetings can be found on our website.